uh, for most of those years, and um, provides a great networking and liaison with um, accessibility groups and is, is serves as their advocate and link to have their voice heard at municipal councils and also uh, to provide uh, information, um, networking, uh, even grant information to municipalities and agencies within the municipalities for accessibility improvements. Um, we, it was said recently, operate on a shoestring, but uh, in fact, um, IACTI does provide some social gatherings as well as online. We've gone online for Zoom meetings and does have some social um, music nights online. And during COVID, um, people with uh, disabilities um, are very, very vulnerable. And so there hasn't been any social face-to-face -face meetings. That may change uh, this year. Um, Marnie is requesting, uh, well, the committee is requesting uh, $250 from the chosen district as a grant and aid, and um, that is to help fund um, sponsoring and providing transportation in some cases to various music in the park um, events so that people with disabilities can get out and socialize once again. Um, our, our expenses have been primarily office outreach, Zoom, and uh, some sponsorships of um, online uh, chats and, and uh, online <laughs> coffee uh, card giveaways and whatnot um, during COVID. And so financially, our expenses weren't high last year. However, we uh, expect to host a number of community outdoor events where we expect a substantial increase in our expenses. Um, historically, until COVID, we, um, the Chosen used to sponsor us uh, for a community picnic. And we'd host it, uh, the Chosen would host it uh, on behalf of IAPTI and invite um, all the organizations, the seniors, and um, people with accessibilities, and we'd have an outdoor picnic behind the fire hall, actually at the, at the market. And if it was raining, we had, uh, we'd be used the community house. <coughs> Any questions? Committee, anybody have a question for Ms. Jenkins? Mayor Little? Yeah, I just uh, a comment. Um, I was the council liaison, as you know, for the last uh, four years with IACTI, and IACTI did provide um, guidance uh, through Marnie Essary for the um, for the for, the, for the, w the renovations of the old school, in terms of the lift, uh, the uh, giving guidance on what kind of a lift versus ramp, uh, the size of the door, and it was very helpful. Um, for us to have that information and it was much appreciated uh, yeah. that kind of advice and, yeah. and through a lens that uh, uh, the rest of us are not uh, looking through so yeah. we really appreciate it yeah and and that's that's the benefit of, of, of building codes don't say it all when it comes to accessibility and um, so having experience and having access to um, the committee who can get you in touch with the experts about that sort of thing because I, uh, I may have been asked directly but I don't have the knowledge or the expertise but we can find and the committee can find the expertise to, to uh, um, discuss some of those projects and hopefully get grants for them too. She's good to that networking that way. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone here from the Wanafuca Performing Arts Center Society? Please. Yes, and may I suggest this lady who Mr. Attorney for Capital would like, perhaps you'd like to hear from her first. Sure, I would like to hear from you at any point in time, absolutely. I'm, I'm sorry, I went to uh, the other part. Okay, no worries. Mm -hmm. 
Hello. Thanks. Thanks for inviting us. I haven't done this before. So if I don't cover all the bases, I've got three minutes. Yep, you have five minutes, and then we'll open up questions. Okay, sure. Uh, so my name is Lana Taves, and I'm here on behalf of Capital Bike. I uh, have a couple roles. I'm education manager, and I'm also an instructor. Um, and you know why I'm here? We're requesting $500 mm -hmm. matching funds. So Capital Bike uh, is a registered charity. And um, we, our mission is to get more people biking more places more often. Do I address just you? Just you. OK. Um, and uh, we mostly focus our resources on um, education and advocacy, celebration events. In fact, today was the commuter challenge. And it was also the launch for the four-week countdown to Go by Bike Week, which starts um, May 29th, so it was a pretty fun and exciting day. Once again, uh, the vast majority of cyclists beat um, the <coughs> motorist commuters uh, in, the, in the challenge. Um, but what we're talking about is the Everyone Rides Grade 4 or 5 program. Um, and here in the Chosen Hands, Helson is the one elementary school. We were there back in uh, two years ago, so 2021. And um, the ERG45 program is, is quite wonderful. It, it's universal, so it, we've been providing it to grade four or five, uh, well, to elementary schools, grade four and five, sometimes grade three, since 2020. And it brings top quality instructors uh, into the school, into the classroom, and into the playground. It's a two day program. We visit usually two days. Um, and uh, we equip students with the skills and the confidence to ride their bikes. All the training happens on the school ground. Um, since we started doing this program, we have had 6,500 kids go through the program and um, 66 schools since 2020. So it's not just for schools that can afford it, which often happens. I'm a parent of children, and sometimes schools can't access these programs. This is offered to all schools in the capital region. Um, and it's inclusive. We, we bring in bikes, uh, some 24 bikes, and three adaptive bikes. So wherever the children are on their cycling uh, adventure, whether they're learning to balance on two wheels or they ride all the time, we have something for everyone. At that age, kids often, if they don't know how to ride yet, they learn that day and they can go home and tell their parents or their adults what they learned in school today, which is riding a bike. Very exciting. Um, so it's very inclusive and it's impactful, and I'm speaking from experience because I'm one of the instructors. We have a lot of feedback from the students, from teachers, from administrators about uh, how much they enjoy this program. We can bring it back every two years, so it's generally for grades four and five, so in two years' time, so at Hans Helgeson, we will be um, meeting a whole new cohort of students. Uh, and you probably had a chance to read some of the uh, feedback, but I will just share one of them for those who haven't read it. This is from a, a grade five teacher at Macaulay Elementary, and they said, this is the best cycling education for students I have ever been involved in. The traffic stop signs and following the rules of the road are so important, not only as a cyclist, but also as a pedestrian. Practicing bike control, how to be safe and prepared were also taught in a fun and engaging way. All of the instructors took the time to learn students' names and were so kind and helpful. It was a huge success, thank you. We often get cards from all of the students. Um, I think maybe I'll leave it at that. If you have any questions, I would be glad to answer. I do have one question. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was learning how to ride a bike mm -hmm. and then learned how to drive, uh, rules of the road and being courteous to people mm -hmm. were really important, yes. sharing space. Mm -hmm. So do you teach the students um, what to say when they're approaching somebody coming up from behind? Oh, for sure. Yes. And what is what is the thing now? Is it ring a bell? Is it call out? 
Does it change? Good question. So often I think a situation that you're referring to would be on a shared pathway where you would most likely be um, finding other people. Maybe here on your rural <laughs> roads where I think shoulders are kind of informally designated as, as shared areas. But we, we definitely talk about how to pass. In British Columbia, Bell is not the law. It is in Alberta. So Bell is, is optional or your voice. Uh, but when we talk about Bells, and at this age, even with adults, it's a good idea to talk about the difference between a friendly Bell and a get out of my way Bell. So how to uh, courteously and safely pass. Um, so voice or Bell and slowing down, letting them know. The courteous bell would be to bring it before you're actually approaching somebody, slowing down, giving them space, not um, requiring anybody to move in order for you to make that pass because we teach them pedestrians always have the right of way. It's a great yeah. question. So we also forward. have a very lengthy um, linear trail, the Galvin Goose Trail. Yes. And it is multi-use, mm -hmm. and there are different walkers, yeah. um, pedestrians, dog walkers, uh, other cyclists, equestrians. So that is one that, especially through COVID, we saw a lot of use on mm -hmm. that trail because mm -hmm. it's the main corridor connecting us to other par other neighborhoods and then up to Soup as well. Right down from my house in Saanich <laughs> too. Yes. Yeah. So it connects. It's, it's quite long. So it's. I found in my own experience there are some variables. So I was just wondering what the the appropriate was, whether it was to call out or not. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that is actually one of the rules of the trail, mm -hmm. is, and, and I'll quiz kids on if, whether they know the rules, but it's to alert others when you're passing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting you ask that because as an instructor, I've been thinking a lot personally about the importance of courtesy on the roads. I think the other end of courtesy is, is you know, road rage. So courtesy is really important in terms of safety and, and we, we do focus on that a lot in this age group. Thank you. Anyone from the committee has some questions? Mayor Lillian? Well, thank you for the presentation and I enjoyed reading uh, the information that you provided, so thank you. Um, Mitchelson is going to be involved in developing a, a transportation plan, an active transportation plan as well, and I'm just wondering, does Capital Bike offer services if we were to, if we were, were to develop it, and we are going to be developing it to have it run by you in terms of getting your feedback? Yes, that's a really timely question as well. That's not something I'm directly involved in. If you went to our website though, I think right after the elections, uh, we sent out information to all the municipalities about uh, like um, something road plan. I don't know if it was the 2030 road plan or the road plan to active trans, something about a road plan. Okay. And I think we sent that package out to all municipalities and if you, well I will make a note okay. and I'll check with our executive director Adam Cooper uh, and make sure that we chose a received one. We can reach out to Adam as well. That's for great. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. You're Thanks welcome. for that. Just a um, point of clarification or information. Um, I think you said you've done this program that you're going to bring to Hans Helgeson to 6,500 kids in the CRD? Yeah. Oh. And that is just in the Ballpark. CRD? Ballpark. Ballpark. Yeah. 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 60... 65, 66 schools. Mm. My notes. 66 schools since 2020, mm. and uh, some 6,500 students. Um, in fact, this morning at the commuter challenge, uh, Rob Fleming, his name almost escaped me, was referring to this particular program because across it, it's. It's not just in Capital Region, it started in Vancouver and it's in the Kootenays and it's in the Okanagan and I don't know what exactly the numbers are but it's in the many thousands. Absolutely. And in fact now there's a, a middle school program that we just piloted at a school last week and it's very exciting to think about that kind of continuity of education. Um, ERG 4.5 as I mentioned just stays on the school ground and the middle school program um, has a road ride. At, at the end of it, which is a lot of fun. Very cool. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry I missed my... No, it's no, okay. Sorry. Hey, um, is somebody from Mitchellison Preschool here? Oh, yes. Sorry? I'm one of the few Okay, sure. Mr. Stock? <laughs> <laughs> My name is David. I'm with the Wanda Fuca Performing Arts Center Society. We call ourselves PACS. We're determined to provide a performing arts center and home for the arts generally on the West Shore. We think this, we're not against hockey rings, we think hockey rings are good. Arts and culture are good too. We're asking for a grant and aid to help us fund uh, a details, an expert study of, the, of accessibility and inclusivity in the design of the new Performing Arts Centre. It um, could be considered to be part of the architectural study for the whole thing, but we thought it would be good to get a head start on the architecture by doing this particular study. And we knew we need expert help. And thank you, by the way, for the opportunity to address you. Obviously, my request is that this committee would recommend to Council that you approve the grant and aid. I'd like to bring forward three ideas. The first idea, which I'm sure Ms. Jenkins is very familiar with, is from uh, Rick Hansen, the man in motion. And he said that this, my disability is I can't use my legs. My handicap is that society does not uh, accept or tolerate or allow for my disability. We want to fix that. We want our Performing Arts Center to accommodate disabilities of all kinds. For the audience members from the time they pull up to the center, get through the doors, through the box office, maybe use the washrooms, find their seats, whether they're in a wheelchair, blind, crutches, canes, whatever. We also want to accommodate disabilities for the performers. So the back of stage, how do they, how do they get backstage? How wide are the, are the passageways from left rings to right wings, that kind of thing? the washrooms, the green rooms, the, the uh, facilities, the dressing rooms and that for, for performers who are in a wheelchair or blind or whatever. And then there's the people that work there. There's going to be dozens of people working there every day and they, their needs should be accommodated as well in our view. The, um, the second idea is the standards for accommodation of disabilities have changed in my lifetime. I remember, I think, many decades ago when um, accommodation for disabilities meant that the theater would take out a couple of seats and put in a flat surface where two or three or four wheelchairs could be lined up. So if someone came in a wheelchair they could be there and their, their friends and family would be somewhere else. I prefer that there was accommodation for wheelchair maybe at the end of every second or third row. So a person in a wheelchair could have to enjoy the experience in the company of their friends and family. Those, those kinds of standards are, are uh, always being uh, augmented and I'd l we'd like to ensure that our design uh, accommodates new standards. And then there's inclusivity. What we intend there is that nobody, audience, performer or worker, will be insulted or belittled or made to feel inferior by anything that is visible in the center or things that are said or done. We would like to have, I see your paddle. My Rotary Club has one too, made by Rust Chips. They're, um, you know, lovely things. So we, we want people to feel included. We have had First Nations people, by the way, on our committee, and uh, they want to, at one point, they wanted to guest the uh, coffee shop and the uh, gift store. Um, my third idea is about uh, the value to the people, the good people that were chosen, many of whom are gathered here today, I see. We're asking for $300, and let me suggest that if a few cars from the Chosen could transfer, instead of going downtown to the Royal and McPherson, could stop in the West Shore, that the citizens of the Chosen would gain that $300 every month, forever. Thank you for listening. I do hope that you will recommend our grant and aid to Council. And of course, available for questions. Anyone from the committee have some questions? Mary. Uh, it's not really a question. I just. Uh, was out at the Mary Winspear Center yesterday for a performance. And uh, while it is an absolutely gorgeous theater, there is just no provision for wheelchairs or walkers. They are jammed in a little space um, between the first row of seats and the stage, and it's not a very big space. 
And so it was really, I thought, wow, that's some really poor planning on their part. Not good enough. Am I right? Yes, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> Not good enough. Thank you. Anybody else? Mary Lillian? So um, thank you for that. I was just wondering, are you going to be reaching out to um, members of the IACTI community? Members of the... Of the um, inter Inter-Municipal Action Committee on Disability Issues, um, the committee that Sandy Jenkins was representing this evening. I see no reason why we wouldn't. What we are attempting to accomplish now is an inter-municipal guidance committee, which I hope the chosen would be part of, for many things, primarily the location, which sure is big-ish, and um, perhaps uh, when chosen would be kind enough to have someone on that committee um, dealing with the disability committee. We, we, we need expert help. I'm not an expert on either accessibility or inclusivity, and that's why we're having a study, a $30,000 study. We've uh, issued a request for proposals to five firms to which, to our knowledge, are competent to do such a study. Um, uh, whether they, they might suggest that we do that, exactly as you suggest, uh, Your Honor, Your Worship. I believe, I believe you, you, there is connection between the Performance Art Society and IACTI. Um, there is a connection there and we are part and parcel to your presentations and so they have their show. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm a chosen preschool. Hello. Thank you for having me today. Um, so my name is Katie Cord. Um, my daughter attends the chosen preschool, and I am a I'm the vice second vice president at the preschool. Um, the Chosen Preschool strives to be a very supportive, nurturing community and family focused preschool. Um, it provides a really high quality um, preschool education um, with parental support at a really low cost. So it's very accessible to people. Um, they have very low um, numbers of enrolment and very high teacher-children ratio. So the, I say education, but the learning from play that the children have is very high quality. And one of the best things about it is it's one of maybe six co-op preschools within the Greater Victoria era. So the co-op preschool it means it's run by the parents. Um, and the parents also get to volunteer within the preschool. So for me, I've been involved with two co-op preschools and um, there's such a fantastic way to be involved in their children's lives. Like I know what she does at school. When I'm a kid, I've got no idea what she does at school. Um, so having a co-op preschool in the chosen is, uh, is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, the kids are aged between two and a half and four and they uh, spend their time um, inside and outside. They also do excursions in the community. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, ride in one of your fire trucks, which was a lot of fun. Um, and they've been to uh, the Sea Bluff Farm. Um, it, it, this is my first um, real immersion to the Chosen, being part of this preschool, and I've got to say, you kind of won me over as a community. Like, it's been really lovely. Um, we're here today to ask for some funds to help with our outdoor area. Um, outdoor play is a big part of preschool life. They start the day there and they end the day there. Um, so we're looking for um, funds to buy more um, gravel, um, more sand for the sand pit, a tarp for the sand pit, and then um, just a few repairs to the box that the sand's in. Um, we have to make sure the outside player is up to a certain standard for licensing. Um, I won't get into how many inches it's got to be, but there's a specific amount. And so we just look to make sure that our outdoor is looking as great as it can because the outdoor space that preschool has is one of the best outdoor areas that I've seen at a preschool. It's really special. Um, yeah, that's it. If you've got any questions, I'd like to hear them. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Committee, any questions? No? Okay. So, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much.
And the Royal Canadian Legion, Branch 91, Mr. Walker. Thank you for inviting me. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Richard Walker. I'm the first Vice President of Branch 91, uh, the Legion in Langford. So we're, our mission statement is, and for those that aren't familiar with the Legion, is to serve veterans, including serving military and the RCMP, and their families. Can't forget their families. We also promote remembrance, and to serve our communities and our country. And to that end, every year we've been doing a, putting on a community Christmas dinner uh, for the needy and homeless of the West Shore, Western communities. So for this dinner, all the work is done by volunteers of the branch and the community. And that means anybody, you know, anybody wants to volunteer for this, get a hold of us and we'll put your name down. So. Each year we provide each guest with a delicious Christmas dinner and present them with a bag containing everything they need to prepare for a Christmas dinner on Christmas Day. We purchase toys so that each child is given an age-appropriate gift. For some, it will be their only Christmas gift. So for 2023, the need is great if not greater. As we've all seen, there's a lot of uh, chaos out there. We're looking at approximately 300 or more people attending the dinner for 2023. And we can make this a better Christmas for the less fortunate in our community. And so we're coming to you with a request for uh, fu funding. Uh, we have a total budget of $6,500 and we're asking for a grant of $350. And that's it. Any questions? Any questions, committee? I, I do have one question. How long have you been doing the Christmas dinner? Uh, at least four years now. Okay. We, we were still doing it as, during COVID, and it was done as a drive through which was kind of neat. You know, nobody actually got to sit down for obvious reasons. They'd come in and get the hot food, you know. Mm -hmm. And Santa and Mrs. Claus would hand out presents, which was really good. Unfortunately, the really good Santa Claus that we have, he has to do a Santa Claus thing over in the mainland. <coughs> Even has a red truck and he looks like Santa Claus, trust me. <laughs> That's great, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, was that four years or 40 years? Was it? Oh, for the, the, the dinner? Christmas dinner, four years or? Four, 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 four. yeah, not 40, no, no, no. <laughs> Well, no, that'd be before my time. <laughs> Okay, do we have someone here from the Vancouver Island South Film and Media Commission? Good evening, committee. I am not Kathleen Gilbert, just putting it out there. I'm Edison Kahaka Willa, I'm a chosen resident, and uh, I've served on the Film Commission board now for about 12 years. So I am filling in for the request for assistance and funding, which is an annualized process in the region with our 13 districts. And this is to assist again in what we do with them. Uh, we try to enhance going between the directors and people that are not from this region and to make it easier so that we can provide what we need to provide for licensing insurance and parking and venues. And it was chosen in such a great place to have um, film here. And I think, if I recall, I saw some unique flags here last year. <laughs> So uh, I know that we, we try our best to uh, spread our goodwill around the region. And with, with that also comes the type of jobs that uh, people seek. And it is, uh, it is also very environmentally friendly and it's something that really helps people feel good about what they do. It's a very people-oriented business. And uh, again, it's, uh, it's we get funding from every part of the region, and so it's, uh, it's just something that we do. Any questions? So we've had a few um, film companies come to Wichosan in the last well, half a dozen years for sure. How does your organization connect with them? Do you represent? Different? We send packages out, so okay. when, when a, a 
producers interested in, in a certain storyline that may require a location like ourselves, we send out packages and we would include places like North Sanish, Central Sanish, and The Chosen because those, those looks are, are very, very similar. And then what happens is then they, they get hold of our office and we go further and sometimes we'll do site visits. So we'll bring people out in, to the countryside and then they all sit there and go, I fall in love with that. And once that's done, everything's easy. Any questions, Kitty? Councillor Gray? And when, in terms of the, it talks about significant direct spending in the district, what kind of chosen as a result of people coming? Is it rental of the venues or parking or what? What's well, while we, we don't oh, actually no. have direct, like, actually calculated <coughs> numbers because those are usually private between, sure. let's say, vendors and, and, and the actual film itself. But having said that, we do know that churches are utilized quite often. I know the district hall is utilized. I know that uh, personal venues get utilized. I know the cafe was, 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 was as well. So it does mean direct uh, spend into the district was chosen. Thanks. Anything else, Penny? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I think that is everybody, unless somebody came in late that I didn't see. Anybody from the Museum Society? Uh, do we have anybody here from the Museum Society? And anyone from the African Heritage Association that arrived? Okay, thank you. Okay, so now is the time where we have public participation. So is there anybody from the community that would like to come up to the mic, state your name and the street in which you live? You have uh, four minutes to speak to the committee. My name is Gary Smurfett and I live on Gilbert Drive here in Michelson. I'm <coughs> speaking about the grant and aid program applications that you've received. The Interdisciplinary Advisory Committee on Disability Issues. They were the impetus in the late 1980s for the modifications <coughs> to sidewalks and curbs to allow wheelchairs and uh, it was a big change in our communities out here, the Western community. They also were the impetus for having bus stops being rammed up so that the people that required that extra elevation to get into the bus could use it. I think groups like that are really important to our community to come forward and they highlight the needs of a part of our community that often gets overlooked in designs. Uh, the second thing I wanted to speak about was the application that you've received from the African Heritage Association. Um, and I have some questions regarding it. The, uh, the application, if you turn to your page uh, 11, the logo at the top of it is the logo of the Machosan Search and Rescue. Uh, that, that baffled me in reading the agenda. And then when I went to item 8 on page 12, they list the objectives of this group that's asking for $2,750. Uh, their objectives are really great, but if they're approved, then I believe you're going to set a precedent for every group that feels that they want to foster a sense of community among these people, the Ukrainians, the Polish, uh, the Scottish, the English, all of that. And the, the goals are just promoting that group, promoting the sense of community among Africans, promote the provision of the best possible services for Africans, promote the cultural developments of its members and African awareness, facilitate communications between its members and between its members and organizations, promote the interests of all its members. They're all lofty goals, but I question whether, and I, I hope I'm not being considered racist here for that, but if you 
uh, accept that as something that the taxpayers and the chosen should be funding, then I think you could be looking. You could be looking at setting precedent for 101 groups of people that have a special uh, ethnic, racial, uh, whatever you want group that's a lot different than what our grounds have traditionally been for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a note of clarification um, or a follow-up. I did actually contact the Machosan Search and Rescue and they are not familiar with the organization or the representatives that were listed on the applicants. So I'm not certain how the their logo got mixed up. The rest of the information was pertinent to the same application for the grant and aid that we have, the form. So I don't know if that was just an uh, internet gremlin or what it was, but I did follow up to find it. And unfortunately, there's no representative here this evening to get any further answers, but search and rescue aren't aware of this group. Anyone else from the community would like to speak? <clears throat> My name is Colin Sparks, uh, 1035 Liberty Drive. Uh, I have a question sort of about towards the, the budget slash financing has been chosen. I'm wondering if any money is uh, going to be set aside towards putting up dividers on certain corners of the roads, like for example Rocky Point Road. Uh, many corners there, large vehicles with their uh, boats going to, I think it's Petter Bay it's called, uh, who drive there and back often uh, aren't aware of their surroundings and the off track really beyond the fog line. So anyone cycling or walking there would be rather uh, uh, screwed to put it lightly. So I'm wondering if any money is being put aside to put some uh, safety infrastructure to protect some people on those corners. Thank you. Councillor, could you be able to maybe answer that? It's seen that it's uh, public works. As far as I know, uh, with the cuts, there was uh, no extra money for, for things like that in the budget this year. Okay. Councillor Shipping? Sure. Um, did we not, though, approve, okay, some uh, budget for painting? And as part of that, weren't there, wasn't there budget allocation for the, um, um, you, you know, safety markers in the roads? Okay. Two different things? The recess cat eyes. Cat eyes, thank you. Yeah, I'm. There was a discussion about that, but I, <laughs> there's discussion about a lot of things, so I, yeah, I don't recall. Mr. Nyski, can you help us? So in the budget item, those two in the budget, those two items are um, budgeted together, one line item. So the so the plan is to prioritize the painting first, and if there's any, hopefully the costs will be what we expect it to be, um, and then if that's the case, then we can expect to have those cat eyes installed. Great, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments or questions they'd like to bring forward? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next part of our agenda. Uh, adoption of the minutes, page 9. Finance Committee, April 3rd, 2023. We have a motion to, uh, to move. So moved. And moved by Councillor Shukin, second by Councillor Gray. All in favor? Carried, thank you. And on page 13, Special Finance Committee Budget Meeting, April 3rd, 2023. Sorry. Move adoption. Moved by Councillor Shukin. Second. By Councillor Gray. Questions? Um, all in favor? Carried, thank you. And on page 17, Special Finance Committee budget meeting of April 13, 2023, there is one change I would like uh, Recording Secretary to um, have a look at. On page 19, uh, section 5, adjournment, it says we adjourned, we started the meeting at 10 a.m. and we adjourned at 10.52 p.m. Could we have that change to a.m., please? We did have one long meeting, but it wasn't, it wasn't that long. Uh, so can I have uh, a motion to move? The, the so moved as amended. Thank you. Uh, okay. Moved by Councillor Shukin. Second by Councillor F. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. 
And then on page 20. Yes, sorry. Uh, excellent uh, reading on, on two accounts that you've done very close reading and mm -hmm. good follow up. So. Good work. <coughs> Thanks. I, I have people that tell me what to do <laughs> sometimes too. <laughs> Thanks. Um, sorry. Uh, receive a minute. So, page 21. This will be the Agricultural Advisory Select Committee meeting of April 6, 2023. I uh, just wanted to point out here that on page 22 in the Chosen Producers Guide, um, for those of you who may or may not have already, the Muse came out last week. Um, it's also online. There's a colorful feature on the center page of the May issue, and it is of the farmers um, who put together a little bit about their farm. Some of them decided to have information on a map and some not on a map. Um, the committee is hoping that um, in the future world <coughs> they will have a website and the idea is to promote, um, it will be a component to this guide that you saw in the news in the hopes of drawing more people from outside of Machosan for um, shopping Machosan grown local food which is a high quality food source for the West Shore and beyond. So um, just another way of advertising, letting people know that uh, we do have great food here, uh, growing in our ground and uh, grazers and all sorts of great stuff. Uh, this, the Chosen uh, Farmer's Market will be starting, I believe they're opening up on the 10th, which is Mother's Day, so a couple weeks, that'll be happening as well. So can I have a motion to receive the minutes for um, the advisory committee of April 6th? Moved by Mayor Lowe, seconded by Councillor Gray. All in favor? Okay. Carried. Thank you. And on page 25, Councillor's update. <coughs> Okay, so uh, just quickly, um, the committee has finalized the open house and most of the open house had the first, second, and third readings of the budget um, with a lot of input from staff in all departments um, and constructive input both from those departments and uh, resident feedback, so appreciate that. Um, Many hours of council deliberations it, uh, were the essence of creating this document, and um, I appreciate the public engagement we've had both online, uh, from the live stream, emails, letters, and people speaking at all the different meetings that we've hosted since uh, January. Um, the Buffer Working Group has just started uh, their meetings. The foundational work is beginning. Now, uh, there will be a site visit soon and some mapping to look at. Um, public engagement meeting will be happening, I believe, next week, the 9th. The 9th. 9th at 7 p.m. here in the chambers. Um, Earth Day, um, we as a council got together uh, at Willing Park uh, with the Wilson Watershed Habitat Protection Association and did some broom not room, Bramble Bashing, there might be a little bit of room there. Um, <laughs> Langford uh, Council was planting trees in the park. We were near the creek. The creek is very uh, integral to Machosan. It flows all the way through our whole community and um, empties into Wicks Lagoon, so it's uh, important for us to take care of these invasive species. Uh, West Shore Parks and Recreation, which I'm a member of their board and representing Machosan, we actually are one of the five owners. Uh, they had, first time ever, an outdoor adventure show. Uh, went there with my son, it was quite interesting. They had fly fishing and archery. Um, they did have some RV camping, it's in tents. Um, hiking and different emergency supplies, even something called a life straw which my, has, uh, my son explained to me is a water bottle with a straw mechanism inside that filters water. And it's not just a filter for making the water taste better, but takes care of things like bacteria and parasites, chemicals, pesticides, and microplastics. So it's an interesting um, mechanism to be ha having in your backpack if you're out in the, in the backwoods. Uh, there's a new program called uh, No-G-Jitsu, 
uh, no, mean, uh, no means not having to have G, which is the kimono that they wear. So this is, um, this is a Brazilian type of martial art, and it's open to um, everybody, so you're not restricted with having a uniform. And it allows you to grab the clothing of your opponent and to control and submit them. Uh, you don't wear the tra traditional uniform, like I say. Instead, you just wear shorts and a t-shirt. And uh, they do have uh, drop-in sessions. So if anybody's interested in some trying something new, uh, that is available. Um, very exciting to report that the skate bar skateboard park will have their grand opening on the 13th from 1 to 3 and I invite <coughs> everybody to go down and have a good look. There are um, users right now that are skateboarding throughout the, I don't know what you call them, bowls and, and I'm going to have to learn the lingo, but I've been watching the build, it's quite amazing. So please do uh, go down there a uh, week Saturday afternoon and have a look. It's a pretty happening place. Um, what else do we have? Um, the AVICC convention, which uh, three of us were able to attend um, this last month. Uh, we had some interesting uh, events to be able to partake in. Um, so we kind of split it up with, with the three of us so we could bring back um, more information and some um, I wouldn't say expertise, but uh, things that would benefit our community here. One of the ones I went on was a, an amenity tour um, about affordable housing plans and different recreational partnerships that they had, similar to what we've seen here in the CRD where uh, municipalities will partner up with some of the schools and share fields and that sort of thing. So that was quite, uh, quite fascinating to see what they're doing. They also had a skate, for, uh, skate park um, and the, at the day we were there, uh, they were grappling with taking some of the graffiti down. So these are some things that we've talked about at West Shore as well, how we're going to manage that sort of thing. Um, the resolution assemblies were quite fascinating. There was a board of four people and one of them was a parliamentarian to make sure the policies and procedures were followed. And I have to say it was, um, we do Robert's rules here, but there it is wild. Um, <laughs> We had a mic with the pros and the mic with the cons, and the debate was very, very engaging. To one point, with one of the resolutions that we had, uh, the whole motion got changed. It got split up into two, and part of it got dropped, and another one got taken, taken up and passed, and it'll be going to UBCM. So it was fascinating to watch the, um, the action and all the different communities on this island and the coast come together and speak of things that are really important in their communities. Uh, Qualcomm had a resolution about eliminating Scotch Room, and it actually has passed to go on to the next level, which will be at uh, UBCM. So that'll be interesting to see what we can learn from that. Um, and another thing that is coming out soon is the Sarah Beckett Memorial Fundraiser, which will also be on the 13th, the morning of the 13th, so that'll be a very busy day. Um, anyone that's looking to do some volunteering, they are certainly um, needing some help. And anyone that would like to uh, walk or run, or virtually walk or run, they do have a website. So this is a great fundraiser. It's a, um, I encourage the community to get outside and be active with them. Uh, the starting point is Starlight Stadium um, in the West Hills area. And um, I believe that Council Shufkin, Mayor Lilla, and myself will be in attendance. And our other two councillors, Councillor Epp and Gray, will be rooting us on from the chosen side. Okay, so that is the councillor's update. Do you sleep at all? <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> so do you sleep at all? Uh, sometimes, yes. <laughs> Um, it's a very exciting job, this job, I have to say. I spent a lot of years as a volunteer in our community here, and uh, now I've been successful, and obviously people have the faith to vote us here at this table, and it's been really interesting. There's a lot to learn all the time, and people are keeping me on my toes, as I think they are with my cohorts. Thank, so thank you, you for coming to me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> May I ask for an adjournment to this meeting, please? Mayor Little, uh, moved by Mayor Little, seconded by Councillor Shukin. All in favor?
Carrie, thank you. So that is all for the Finance Committee agenda this evening. The next meeting will be the Council meeting. And you're all welcome to stay tonight as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, stay in touch. Absolutely. Can I ask yeah, you? I might have to wait to find out why so we have such a huge usually send a letter out increase in our tax. The, the, the I know that last year we had a tax increase of 5.9%. Yep. And this year we're talking about 14%. It's just that yeah. well, we've had some yeah. numerous yeah. budget yeah. meetings. They will go to the public and we had a budget of the price. We the public last year. So, you know, it's sort of a yeah, you can find most of the websites. It's, it's yeah. sort of across the board. I don't have to do it. Well, there was a lot of different so reasons. Like there was a like police uh, cost. There was this one to be present. I was just sort of saying, okay, it's that, it's that. Um, there was that. Um, there was almost across the board. There was increases in everything. Like the costs of everything have gone up. Like a couple of good percent. And uh, that was a minimum too. Yeah, there was a problem too. Um, there was some staffing. Uh, we had a yeah, sure. yeah. got a big raise, um, so all the union staff have got yeah. some other cases. Um, yeah. There's plans uh, yeah. to hire a new CAO on the line, and um, there was a new, there was, it's going to be a new legislative assistant, uh, and we just said uh, they've voted uh, for agricultural studies, for agricultural studies, and uh, also something in public works, and, you know, so it's just you know, it's kind of a cross the, you know, the board as far as, uh, as where the interface is. I can't just say one thing, you know, one of the things that several different things. No, the one that I really highlighted was um, well, there was the travel and conferences from 5,500 to 35,000. So, yeah, there was a, uh, it's more that there's a, you know, a new, a new Luxel, and uh, yeah. experience to do It's in Vancouver, the UBC. Thank you. We probably won't spend all that, for we call time. Okay, we're just we're just pausing for the live stream. Just uh, bear with us for a few minutes here. Can it help Tina to turn the computer on? Uh, it's, it's the
feel free, Gary. <laughs> Okay, welcome everybody. This is the May 1st, uh, 2023 Council meeting. I'll take a motion to uh, approve the agenda with the addition of uh, 8B, which is public input into the strategic plan. Anybody else have any other amendments with that? I'll take a motion. Moved by so Councillor Shukin, second by Council Donaldson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, presentations, we have none. Um, with that, we'll move to public participation. Would anybody like to speak? If so, come to the mic and give us your name and your street, please. Patty Whitehouse, 5311 Rocky Point Road. Um, and I have um, one very quick item to tell you that on Saturday, I was filled to pieces to see two and even once three bars of reception on my cell phone <laughs> down on Phyllis Narn Bar. Phyllis Narn Road, that's the one. Right <laughs> point road. And then crushed the next day to find it back to SOS only as it is now. So I don't think the problem solved yet. <laughs> but what I, um, the main part thing that I want to uh, address. I have two points regarding the draft letter to the Ministry of Housing regarding Homes for uh, People Action Plan. And it's, I think it's really important that um, this issue be addressed to the Minister. Respectfully, I have some concerns about the strength of the letter that has been written. In paragraph 3, um, we point out that this action plan lacks sufficient detail to know whether it's the intention of the province to quadruple the residential population of rural areas. Uh, oh, and for those who don't know what the heck I'm talking about, this is the proposal by uh, the province to allow um, four dwellings on all properties that currently, where currently one dwelling are permitted. Um, this has, and I quote, this has understandably created uncertainty and anxiety amongst Matrosian residents who value their rural lifestyles. It's strategically weak, in my opinion, to lead with concern amongst Matrosian uh, residents who value their rural lifestyles. The truth is that our concern about our lifestyles is neither more nor less important than the similar concern of urban residents who are on single family, in single family zoning, who are facing being surrounded by quadruplexes. <coughs> um, people argue against that, uh, that argument as being selfish, and in a sense it is. Um, there are strong, much stronger arguments, and I'll come to that. The, uh, and, and if this is some, um, um, pitting the protection of lifestyle against the common good, or the greater concern of the common good, which is housing for all who need it. But I think there are much stronger arguments in favor of keep, keep, keeping rural areas rural. And this follows on from the following sentence, the land base contributes to local food security and valuable ecological protection in the region that include important forests, meadows, creeks, and shorelines. Um, the, certainly the second part of that is true, I'll address the food security question in, in a moment, but um, it doesn't say anything about why those things are so important. And in my opinion, it needs to be made just much stronger. In a climate emergency, as we are in now, the real value of rural communities, the value that's much greater than providing housing, is in the ecological services provided by our forests, fields, waterways, and shorelines. Things like carbon sequestration, biodiversity, the cleansing of air and water, the control of runoff. Um, and there are other functions that others can articulate far better than I can. Um, on the human scale, as we saw during COVID, the mental health services offered by uh, our forests and fields and so on to urban dwellers are the opportunity to immerse themselves in nature. Um, are, are really important, far more important than just um, that we have for, for this man who's Greeks and Sherline. Um, these are the reasons those things are important. Now, there's nothing wrong with including food security in the list of benefits uh, associated with keeping rural communities rural, but let's be realistic. 
Matoka's impact on regional food security is minimal. Combine the food production of all the rural communities in the CRD, and while it is a contribution to food security, it's not large enough or critical enough on its own to offset the negative impacts of the housing crisis. Um, personally, if I were writing this letter, <laughs> I would remove the last two sentences from paragraph three and insert a new paragraph that makes these points about the, the real value of the forests, fields, uh, waterways, and, and shorelines. Um, and I would insert it with context that imposing the action plan on rural communities would be a huge mistake because it threatens those values. And I would also make a point of engaging North and Central Sandwich and Highlands to encourage similar responses on their part. And, and there has been discussion of engaging with the other rural communities. I think it's uh, absolutely necessary. I think it's a critical time for rural communities to collaborate to preserve the ecological services provided by forest fields, waterways, and shorelines for the common good, not just of the region, but of the world. And uh, I just want to add that the following paragraphs outlining planning considerations are, are good information, but the, the message to the minister, in my opinion, needs to be much stronger. Thank you. Leonard Davidson, Speyside Lane. I had the privilege about two weeks ago of having one of the phone calls from the Premier of BC, and uh, you know, so I could fire a question at him. And there was everyone from all over BC who had registered. And um, he speaks about you know, housing, more housing. And as I did for a long time work for the proving officer, and the major thing I said to him was infrastructure. You're not talking about the infrastructure. If you don't have water, you can't build houses. You can't supply it. Kootenays has now had a terrible problem all year with water. We even said it. Um, Chaminas, right into the fall, no water. Um, we saw a actual schedule here just a week after I talked about infrastructure to the Premier. And it was, they went through, CRD is a little low, just for all of the infrastructure producing water. If you don't have water, you can't build houses and you can't supply it. So, and uh, his answer to me was <laughs> more piping, <laughs> more piping, because they had a, a pipe fail in one of the large ones in the Kootenays. And so he said, we rushed up there and we put more piping in. But the Kootenays, is having a terrible problem with no water. You don't, so what if you put more pipes? You haven't got the water, and you can't build without water. And that's where everyone is in, the whole of BC is in the same problem. So I think your letter should put that back. It's the infrastructure. If you don't have the sewer, any sewer or water, you haven't got anything. You can't put people there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, good evening. Jane Hammond, 5447 Rocky Point Road. Um, I'm here to add um, my comments and a question relating to the draft as well, um, concerning the initiative that we've just heard about, Homes for People Action Plan. Um, and first of all, uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, that you have acknowledged the leadership of the provincial government in uh, taking up um, on this big question of addressing the housing crisis. Michosin is not exempt and our community does have specific needs for more housing options. In regard to the letter, I'm going to not go into the context. I don't have any of the background information that um, has been prevented or presented. But I'd like to speak only and briefly to the reference of the CRD Housing Needs Assessment project that was done in 2021. The assessment refers to a report, this report, completed more than two years ago in 2021. 
It addressed the housing needs of the individual municipalities in the CRD. I believe 11 out of the 13 municipalities complied, Mitchosen being one of them. The Mitchosen report was prepared by our previous planner. It's detailed and provides a readable summary in which local housing needs are identified. Statements pertinent to Mitchosen relate to key areas of affordable housing, rental housing, housing for those with disabilities, housing for seniors, housing for families, and those termed as homeless. Now the Statistics Canada data that was used for this report was from 2016. The report was done in late, late, late 2020. So already um, the likelihood of that data being out of date by the time the report was presented is, you must read that into it if you read the uh, report. The report was received and filed by Council in February 2021 and to my knowledge it has never been mentioned again until now in your letter, in your draft letter. So what caught my attention was the sentence in paragraph 4 of the draft letter to the Minister. Basically it says, noting that Mitchosen partially addresses housing affordability by allowing attached and detached suites. Paragraph 4 ends with a quote, other residential options are being considered in response to the recently completed housing needs assessment in order to meet our community's needs into the future. This is good news <laughs> to see it in print. Um, I, among many, will be anxious to hear if and when and how the community might be involved in a strategy to address this very serious topic and work towards a chosen compatible solution. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak at the council? Go ahead. Caroline Cliff Drive. I just wasn't clear when you added 8B, was that the opportunity for public input? So comments there, or are you going to be reporting on what input you received? So this is right now this is public participation for anything for the council. Specifically item 8B is for public input put about the strategic plan. Great, thank you. I'll wait until then. Okay. <laughs> Hello again. Uh, my name is Colin Sparks, uh, 1035 Liberty Drive. Uh, yes, but chosen does allow uh, small secondary homes, but for uh, many families, many families who have kids who want to stay at home, since it's extremely expensive to move elsewhere, these small uh, secondary units are not enough for them. Particularly, they want to uh, have families uh, or stay in place there because, like, 900 square feet for say a few siblings, that's not going to really. Uh, cut it, particularly with myself, who's under two acres, so uh, I don't really fall under the ability to be able to have that, is uh, my understanding. So I was quite uh, excited to hear about BC's plan about getting rid of single family zoning and allowing uh, fourplexes for property, and this would allow me to stay in the chosen. Uh, or even for that matter, for the West Shore. Uh, many people in the Chosen already build multiple uh, units on their properties, so allowing, uh, sort of going with the government's uh, initiative here would mean that the Chosen could now have safety regulations applied to those uh, many illegal suites, and also perhaps get some tax revenue off of it to uh, help fill the much needed need uh, for tax money. And I, I, I really appreciate all the relationships I've been building with all of you, and I hope uh, uh, I continue that as well. So if I say anything that comes across as damaging or burning bridges, that's not my intention. I just I'm really concerned about uh, Machosen's future. The uh, fact is that a lot of the world is rapidly changing, whether Machosen is liking it too much. The housing crisis is particularly coming really uh, quite extreme, with most homes now going like over 20 to 30 times the average income, and of many places going four to six thousand dollars per month for rent, which is not achievable for so many people. And while Machosen is sort of outside the urban containment boundary, Machosen is 
in, if you look at well, the map, the Chosen's like inside a city, you've got municipalities all around us developing rapidly. So the Chosen is part of the problem why housing is so expensive, being the second largest municipality but the lowest population. And well, I, I really do appreciate Ruinous and I quite like it. I find it personally a bit morally wrong when it's inside a city and not, say, out in the middle of nowhere, like say on a Gulf Island or Leech Town or uh, say even further in the island where it's more appreciated because it's not causing any huge concerns compared to Machosen where it's really preventing a lot of uh, housing from being done. But it's not necessarily meaning Machosen needs to go all out bananas and sprawl and destroy everything we have here. We could do what many European places do, which is allow density and walkability so you don't need a car to get around in small uh, densified areas, but then leave ruralness and nature and farms around it so you're still providing housing but then you're also at the same time not losing some of your values because eventually as the housing crisis gets even worse, particularly with say the climate change really hits the fan, where are all the people going to be coming to? Are they going to be coming to the co coasts and the northern uh, of the continent? So it, it, it just becomes quite a uh, quite the problem that shows it's going to be facing, particularly if the government uh, really starts getting mad about municipalities uh, having some issues figuring out how to do this. Uh, they might just step in and override everything, meaning we lose all of our values. So if Machosen was to sort of get on the game ball and have, say, some new small dense mixed-use areas that support Machosen's values, then perhaps Machosen will be able to keep its values in the future when uh, things really get desperate for more housing and then we could possibly lose all say in how that's done. So I'm just quite concerned that if Machosen's not going to be acting on how to uh, provide uh, more means for housing, that they're going to lose all say in their values and perhaps a future even bigger government mandate in the far future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Cole. Right. Uh, Sarah Anthony, 4290 Machosen Road. I'm very tired. We did Eric's taxes today, and so I'm going to try and read this. Um, so yeah, I want to also comment on the letter that you're uh, planning to write to the minister regarding the single family zoning. So ultimately, um, I would like to see some exceptions for rural areas like Machosen, but um, I do think we should be doing something to show that we are or, uh, doing something that is appropriate for Machosen, um, that shows we're doing something and not just think that we're completely special and the only, like, it just, like, comments, it doesn't really make sense. Um, so some of my suggestions that obviously I've talked about before would be allowing tiny homes as secondary dwellings. Um, perhaps even having a tiny home park zoned uh, on a couple acres. I, from what I hear, we possibly might get some land because there's a subdivision going in, which to me is kind of interesting that we get a subdivision for rich people, but it would be nice if maybe there could be a little carve out for something affordable for regular people. Um, maybe increasing the size of the suites to 90 square meters. So like this would actually match ALR regulations, which I find kind of interesting. We have, if, like if you live on ALR here, you actually can't benefit from that. I think you have to go to ALR and try to get it approved. So we have lower restrictions than um, ALR does. So that's kind of frustrating for farmers from people I've talked to, who, especially people who would like to be able to have their kids who have kids. And that's a big demographic right now um, in my age group is friends who, uh, they have children and they have nowhere to go. I mean, it's just impossible for people our age to buy anything and stay here, you know. I, I don't know what we're going to end up with in the future here with that. Um, yeah, so those are some suggestions. Wanted to comment specifically on a couple things in the letter. I found it kind of an odd comment that it would quadruple Machosen's population. I think that would be contingent on the idea that every homeowner in Machosen would like knock their house down and build a fourplex. I'm guessing none of you guys are planning to do that. So um, I, I don't think most people are going to do that. I don't really like the idea either personally of having that. I think it's open to some other issues. So yeah, I, I just found that an odd comment and I think that there's better ways to address that in the letter. Um, you also get, as, as was mentioned before, you mentioned that there are other residential options that are being considered, and yeah, bated breath, man. I'd love to know what those are. Um, hopefully some of the ones that we've suggested in the past. Um, so just starting closing with that, I think as a community, we have the ability 
to make a difference to at least some people who are struggling with housing um, without disturbing the rural nature of Michosin, um, and at least make it possible for residents to help their families and loved ones, or even, um, actually one of the things I had on my list that I realized I forgot to say was um, having some kind of little places that the city could build that were meant for far or for maybe for farmers, for municipal workers, for the fire department that we owned that we could, yeah, still charge for and then bring in some money maybe too. Um, but the main thing I think is that people do want to be able to help their families. And and I, yeah, again, I don't think many people want to see skyscrapers here. Maybe there's a few people who are hanging on the property so hoping to develop one day and that's their dream, but I don't think that's most people's here. So I just think if we have some control of this, we can make decisions to see what Machosen would look like because it is, everything's going to change. No matter what we do, it's going to change. So can we make it change in a way that is going to be good for us, that's going to keep this a good place to be for everyone? So thank you guys. Thank you. <coughs> Gary Smith at Gilbert Drive. I, I haven't intended to speak on this, but I have to. Two years ago, the ex-building inspector told me that there are over 500 illegal dwelling units in this community. Now those dwelling units may be safe, they may not be safe. The fire department may know about them, they may not know about them. As far as sewage disposal in this, our community, uh, we, we're not living on gravel beds like Colwood where you can have a small lot and put a duplex, a fourplex, on a quarter acre. That's why our minimum zoning here is one acre. You have to go through VHA to get the sewage permits to put a sewage field on. And that takes up a lot of land. If you're talking about a fourplex, well, that's a lot more. It'd be nice to have fourplexes that were legal. That would mean that we would get the tax revenue for it. We would get that money to help pay for the roads in our community, to pay for the children going to the school, for the fire protection, for the police. I, mean, I think that's the reality that we have here that the city of Victoria doesn't have to face, the city of Colwood, where they have control, tighter controls of what goes on. Uh, it would be interesting to know if there's still 500 illegal dwelling units and how many and I use the term, that's the term he used was illegal, but how many legal ones there were? You know, I, I would suggest it might be 2,500 or so. So we're talking about a 20%, you know, number that, that's uh, not showing up in the taxes. And there was that incident with the previous council where they went after a property that had seven or eight tiny homes on it. Uh, I wasn't involved in it, but I heard about it when I was on vacation. Uh, I saw it when I came back, and I went on the assessment. And the assessment notice just showed one house. You know, uh, I think we have to be realistic about some of these things when we approach it. You know, we are not the same as the city of Vancouver. You know, we're we're not. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris Vandy Water, 4569 William Head Road. <coughs> I would like to speak on the letter that uh, I haven't read it, but um, it shows that asking for an exemption from the BC Housing Directive. And so here we are. Um, I don't think that's the right approach to take. I think that a, a spirit of negotiation would be way better. I don't think the province has any idea or made any rules behind their directive so this would be a good time for Machosa and, <coughs> and I'm sure there's other like-minded municipalities to uh, enter into a spirit of negotiation and um, we have areas of housing <coughs> deficiencies that that uh, Chosen can address, and uh, there's so many people clambering on our borders that 
and the federal government allows all this immigration, so it's only natural that we feel pressured. And we should all help out in finding a solution. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Eric White, 4290, Michosan Road. Um, let's start off with the, the Colin thing here. It's nothing personal, and we're all talking in concepts because I'm not for developing all of Michosan and sprawl, but there is something to be said for. Um, uh, concentrated development. We have a choice here, we can subdivide everything down to two two acre lots and have 5,000 residents with 5,000 driveways or we can densify and put 5,000 residents in one building and have one driveway. Uh, the ALC was concerned about footprint over land, well that's the exact thing that when you densify you reduce. So, in theory, if everyone really, you know, if the whole heart of them believed that the environment was the most important thing in their world, well, we would all condense Machosen into 10 buildings on 100 acres. I did the math to figure it out what it would take. 100 acres out of Machosen's 70,000 acres. And so the rest of the 69,900 acres could go back to wildlife, but no, we're not quite there. We don't want to densify like that because everyone wants their autonomy and their space, but we need to do something. We need to figure out a way, a middle ground, where Machosen can allow for more population because people will have kids and those kids will want to stay with their family and their parents will want them to stay with their family. And it's important for us, especially as a farming community. And a part of being a farming community is figuring out how we're going to keep our farms operating. And a big part of that is labor. Now, what we're asking our farmers to do currently is to have their employees, farm help, whatever it is, commute in from the city. We are saying that we don't have enough residents out here for, you know, as it is. And you will have to go live in a denser, part of Langford or call it or whatever because we're not going to accommodate our farmers to have more accommodations on their property. We're going to say, yeah, we, we believe that farming is important, but we're not going to help you by getting you the farm workers. We're not going to protect the environment by having those farm workers commute every day, right? If they woke up on the property, there's no traffic, right? There's no need for more infrastructure. So, those are a few notes on the subject. Also, as the chosen is on a provincial highway, we do have the ability to designate which areas are densified. And, again, provincial highway, let's use that corridor appropriately and keep the population, you know, the denseness away from what we consider sacred, our farmland and our parks, and just use what we have in the appropriate manner. I've covered almost everything, but I have to really nail home that on February, on February 25th, you guys walked in the coldest night of the year, which was directly related to the reduction of poverty. Housing is one of the largest contributors of poverty in our community. So put your money where your mouth is and make sure that something gets done about it, please. Also. You guys stated how much you value human rights. Housing is a human right. Please keep that in mind when you make your decisions about people's needs and it's not a privilege to live here. It's a right to have a house over your head. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So with that, uh, we'll move on. Thank you for everybody for speaking at uh, public participation. So on page three of your agenda, we'll move to the adoption of the minutes from April 24th. Um, had a chance to look at them. Comments? Want to make a motion to uh, move by Councillor Hepp, sec seconded by Councillor Donaldson. Comments? Concerns? 
Call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Okay, moving on to Mayor's report. I had a written report in the last uh, council meeting. Uh, just as far as a, um, a verbal update, uh, Council Donaldson mentioned that uh, we had participated as a council with the Langford uh, community and Langford Council on Earth Day on April 22nd. Uh, we were assisted by members of the Bilston Watershed, Bilston Creek Watershed Habitat Protection uh, Association, um, and joined by Ian McKenzie and Kim Hill, Allison LeDuc and others to pull brambles. It was a great opportunity uh, to uh, collaborate with Langford uh, at William Park. Um, so thanks to Councillor Shukin for organizing their Earth Day event. And thanks also to Miss um, Sandy Bernardin, who is the uh, park steward at Willing Park. Um, uh, yeah, she's a volunteer steward there. And also thank you, thanks to Langford Council for extending the invitation to us, it was great. So uh, thanks to everybody who was involved with that. Um, secondly, the uh, Citizens Environmental Network Awards were on Earth Day as well, later in the day. And one of our members of our community, Colin Sparks, was awarded um, a youth uh, award for his environmental stewardship. And since he's here this evening, I thought we would all offer him congratulations to this great policy. Congratulations, Colin. Okay, with that, uh, we'll turn to the business arising on page 11 of your council agenda. This is from the community planning, rec planning portfolio uh, recommendations of April 17, 2023. Councillor Shukin. Um, thank you very little. Um, this letter needs work. Um, what I would propose to do is that we approve it subject to revisions, and then I'm happy to take a shot at some of the revisions and share it with the uh, share it with council, and, uh, and and then it is ultimately your call, given you know, it's your signature. But um, I, I do have to point out. Um, yeah, before, there, before you begin, <coughs> let's let's just move to the recommendation oh, that we I'm are sorry. going. That's yeah, okay. Yeah. That we're we're going to write the letter, and just so we're, our business is complete, and then we can go on to the letter. If that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you want to make the motion? Um, well, sure. I would. Well, um, <laughs> sorry. I wonder if uh, the rest of council has comments about. Yep, so, so this was just uh, that uh, we're, um, this is business that has brought, been brought forth okay. from the community okay. plan on page 11. And this was a recommendation to council. So we're just going to go ahead. Sure. Um, uh, moved and seconded that Councillor Shukin and Donaldson, uh, uh, that council write a letter to the Honourable Ravi Callum Minister of Housing respectfully advising the Council's concerns regarding the new Provincial Government's Housing Initiative and that the letter expresses Council's interest in working with the province on this issue. Okay. So moved. That's moved by Councillor Shukin, seconded by Council Donaldson. All in favour? Or did you sure. want to make very... Um, I just comment? may say the Council approved that motion already on um, April 24th. Was it the Council or was it the Community Planning? Planning. Was it planning? Okay, so then this was included in the package for context. Was yeah. it? Yeah, okay. My mistake. Okay, so okay, thank you. Okay. So let's go on to the letter. Um, I'm just gonna, if I could just suggest, uh, Jay, you're talking about, or Councillor Shugan about redrafting it. We might just redraft it. It might be better than taking this letter and redrafting it particularly, but that was just my thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's a good opportunity for everybody to speak to the letter. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Oh, and, and I, I share, uh, in particular, um, Patty Whitehouse spoke, and I, I share many of the, uh, the, the concerns she has. And I, I really dislike the reference to rural lifestyles. Um, our concerns are much deeper than that, and that smacks of privilege. And I, I, again, you know, the comment is often made that there's, you know, there's some rich element. Um, Sure, there's, there's wealthy people in this community as many others, many other communities. Um, 
but I, I, many of us are of modest means. Um, the other, yeah, there, there's many things that I, I, I really think need to be addressed with this letter. I just will leave it at that. So. Okay. Anybody else wish to speak to it? Go ahead. Yeah, just like a, a, cl a clear slate to re rewrite, I guess is what I'm thinking. The, what I was imagining, um, it certainly covers a lot of ground and offer compliments to the author, but it, I think it should be shortened and tightened up. And um, I, I appreciate what um, Chris Vanderwater said about, you know, it's kind of like a negotiation here. So it's a good idea to be, an, we're at a very early stage one. We don't really have a sense of what the plan is. Um, it's not been declared that it actually would cover Chosen. It's, it's you know, been laid out in that way. I think we keep it short and sweet, less than a page, and deal with uh, basically a little bit more clarity on the plan. Mention we currently do provide the attached and detached suites. Touch on our reservations about further increasing housing density, as it, some have talked about tonight. But also speak about our contribution in green space, the, some of the other words mentioned by folks tonight. Um, and then it kind of then we're in a, I think a better position with the province just to continue a discussion with them, mm -hmm. and I think that would fit what you were describing at our last meeting as well, Mary. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Councillor Ed, um, yeah, I think the letter needs to be a lot more concise. Uh, I thought it it was too long, and uh, had just a, it just just rambled on a bit. Um, and I do think that some of the points brought up tonight are important for us to think about, uh, especially working with the province. So. And negotiating, as as Chris mentioned, but also, well, that and that is quite, and that is really important because, as Colin mentioned, um, you know, the province could just roll right over us. I can't remember your exact expression, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, so so yes, I, I agree. The letter really needs to be to be rewritten. Okay, thanks. Um, I just want to thank staff for the for the draft of the letter uh, for us to some. Um, backbones for the letter and it needs to be um, um, drafted uh, differently uh, I think we've all spoken to that we've got uh, some equal or sorry not some equal but uh, common ground with our concerns regarding some of the verbiage here some reorganization um, keep it tight and simple and and concise and the whole point of this was to get ahead of the game mm -hmm. And so rather than wait for uh, a legislation to come down and then having us to try and either fight that or, or change it, we thought it would be better to be proactive, not to write a feisty letter or uh, a mean-spirited letter, just a letter of collaboration to say, this is what we've done so far, we're looking at other options, and let's, let's have some collaboration here and some discussions. And so I think what we'll do is go back and redraft a letter, um, and then we'll circulate it uh, by email. We'll bring it back to another council meeting if that's okay with everybody. Okay, and and thanks again to staff. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I, do we have to bring it back to another council meeting? I mm, guess um, I think we do. I th I would yeah. uh, in in the essence of transparency. I think we should. Okay. Is that okay? Y yeah, for sure. And I guess getting us all on the same page is tricky by email that speaks to the transparency of processing. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Great. Any other comments? Go ahead. Yeah, I'd be ha happy to work with Councillor Shuk and see what we could uh, put together for the next meeting. Sure. Okay. Okay. Sure. Great. Councillor Dawson. I, I want to um, commend the people that spoke about this tonight and the consideration of our use and how we have been using it and how we may use it in the future. Um, I always appreciate the different perspectives that people share, whether we agree or not. Uh, it certainly is valuable to us, so thank you all that did speak about that. There's uh, lots, to, lots to consider, and uh, we'll do our best to uh, replicate that, I think, in a, a forward-moving letter, as you say, not to wait till you know, it's top-down, but to work hand-in-hand -hand with the province on this is, is uh, more fruitful for us, too. Okay, great. Thanks for the discussion, everybody. I appreciate that. Okay, so we'll, we don't need, really need a motion for that. We'll just do it. We'll move on to 8A. So 8A is a consideration of the draft council's strategic plan 2023 to 2027, uh, 26 rather. Um, and uh, we've got something for the screen as well, but this is going to be followed by 8B, which is a, pub a chance for the public to 
uh, comment on the strategic plan. Hey, 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 that's great. So thanks everyone. I'm going to walk through the uh, strategic plan, and uh, I'm reminded of a, a you know a life experience. So you know when you learn to tie your shoes for the first time, it takes you a long time. That's kind of messy. Well, this is maybe our first time at tying our shoes, shoestrings, shoelaces. So um, we began um, the strategic planning process in November of 2022. Uh, we came. We spent a day together under uh, the leadership of our. our interim CAO, who provided us with a framework and sort of the focus of discussion. And we did come away with um, some key ideas in terms of strategic thinking and toward it, an integrated plan. And by integrated, that would mean, you know, an, a, a, an amalgam of where you're thinking about your priorities, your financial means, and um, your, your ability to actually execute those in terms of time and budget and all that. So, um, after November, we took a little bit of a break and we redrafted the plan in January. We sat down together in, in February, and then we finalized what you're about to see here in late March. And so what we did, if I can get to this here. Do you know, Tina, do you know how to expand it? Larger than that? Yeah, larger. And actually, I'd just like to focus on... Okay, sure. So what we did is we focused um, basically on a, a cascade down, like a, a hierarchy of ideas. So we began with four strategic pillars, which basically follow the environment, social, governance, um, ESG model, with economic in there as well. We next went to priorities within each of those uh, the pillars, and then we went to more um, uh, more granular issues in terms of we call them strategic topics. So I'm going to walk through each of these, but that's sort of that's the, the the picture in short form, covering the pillars, the ESG pillars, the priorities, and our strategic topics. Okay, this is right. <laughs> really hard to see so um, so first one economic pillar I can I'm gonna run through just the ideas very quickly okay so the economic pillar um, I'll just run through the top line things number one effective management of the growing communities fund and you recall we got that uh, news of that announcement of 2.4 million dollars um, in funding for infrastructure I think it was in March. Uh, second is refine the asset management plan. Um, as of course we know, the district has assets, whether it's our roads or dump trucks, th this building, uh, the grounds that we have, and just looking a little bit closer at how we manage those assets over time. Develop uh, a management, management and operational plans for the chosen school set, and we'll be hearing more about that in, in the coming weeks. Uh, research and apply for additional community grant opportunities and look for community volunteer resources. So we've had tremendous luck over the years, especially through uh, Chief Stephanie Dunlop in terms of getting grants, and the goal is to tap into um, what other grants might be out there for anything like uh, active transportation to, um, I don't know, some of the other planning initiatives that we might find, and, and in time also uh, initiatives that might support our grower growers in the community. Uh, reassess the district's approach to roads and transportation management. And this is a pretty significant one. We, this year, part of the budget exercise was addressing the roads budget and the, um, 
the interest that staff brought forward in, in restarting um, some of the, the initiatives that have been set aside over the years. So whether it's more active ditching, uh, more active shouldering, and mowing of mowing of, um, of the shoulders. And we started out, and those specific budget items were, were really significant from Public Works, was that this the need was quite significant because some of that work had not been done for years. We chose to scale back some of that budget, but have a deeper look. Um, we will likely be hiring a consultant to do this. A deeper look at how we manage our roads, including uh, a paving schedule, or at least that's something that I'd like to have a look at. Uh, finding the creation of an economic sustainability working group or advisory committee. And Mary Lynn, any, any further comments on that one, specific? Yeah, and so um, the reason why I've been talking about this since November is because we often talk in Mitch Rosen about we want to stay rural, we want to stay rural. Now we have to start talking how. How are we going to do that? And so I would, in the fall, like to uh, put forward a framework for an economic sustainability uh, committee uh, to give us, as council, advice on on um, how we are going to stay economically viable and sustainable in this community. Great. Final one under uh, um, economic pillar, limited development in accordance with the official community plan and regional growth strategy. Of course, we've been talking about that for the last little while, so we'll uh, see where that goes in time. The next uh, pillar that we looked at was the environmental pillar. I'm just going to read through the top line elements here. So here it is. <laughs> Sorry, that is tough to read. Uh, there were five elements here. Launch and complete a public engagement process on the future of the buffer land that is underway. Develop a process to facilitate land protection. And this is one that we threw out right at the very beginning um, of our discussions, and I, I think it was originally noted as a covenant strategy. Councilor Gray, anything further to say on that one? Uh, develop a process to facilitate land protection? <laughs> very broad, but uh, we, we'll, we'll get into it over. Sure, well, we talk, we've talked, you know, quite a bit of land is preserved by landowners, but there's an opportunity at times to go further and protect land. And so we have, for example, right now some correspondence from a uh, resident who is asking about covenanting part of their land. The notion is that we would um, uh, set up a, uh, a menu of options for people so that we're knowledgeable about this and can point people in the right direction to do that kind of thing. There's also, uh, during the climate uh, discussions, um, and ideas about uh, zoning land differently uh, when people were uh, wanting that kind of thing to uh, have a higher level of protection of the natural resources on their land. Mm -hmm. Great. Examples only. For sure. Uh, third one under environmental pillars, complete the climate action plan. Uh, following that is development of watershed and aquifer protection strategy. And uh, some of these are intended to start this year, some will actually start next year potentially. The, and in, in this case, one of those is develop a shoreline protection plan, um, which I find interesting. Councilor Gray, uh, once again, how many kilometers of coastline do we have? Is it 20, 50? Fifty. Fifty. <laughs> I was going to say you. sixty, but there you go. We're, we're fifty-five. <laughs> okay. Thanks. And that, and, I, and again, that's a significant amount of coastline for a community of our size in terms of population. So, okay. We next go down to the social pillar, and I think there are six items here. Uh, Number one, support volunteer recruitment and retention and engagement. I've been tasked with doing that, so if you have any ideas about recruitment and retention of volunteers, uh, please contact me. And we're going to be meeting here with the Machosan Grounds Group on Thursday, and that is the topic of discussion. Um, next is implement safe crossing at Hans Helgeson School, and bravo to Councillor Rep, who's been uh, driving this one along for many years, and we're going to see some action this year. Wonderful. Develop an agricultural plan, which we've been hearing about uh, for many years, and finally we're going to get it done this year. So we have budgeted for that project. Develop an active transportation plan, and Councillor Epp and I have had some discussions with a consultant on that, and uh, that's that's one we will likely take next year. Uh, develop a village core strategy, and this is one that we'll be looking at more closely next year. Where it goes is going to be up to the people of Machosan. But I think we know a few things that uh, we're more and more popular, that we have major population centers uh, growing up on our key access points, 
and we're going to have to understand how to deal with that. Everything from what do we want to be in terms of um, bringing in big events to um, how we handle COVID. So look for that coming next year for sure. And conduct a traffic safety assessment and develop an implementation plan. And uh, part of that comes from Hans Helgeson, but we know that there are dangerous areas throughout the, uh, throughout the community as well. So. And finally, uh, the governance pillar. And this is the, the very last one. Um, so adoption of a respectful workplace policy, that has been done. Adoption of a code of conduct, uh, Council's working through that right now. Introduction of a good neighbor bylaw. Now as I understand this, this is the potential of a catch-all bylaw that covers nuisance issues. Noise, um, unsightly premises, um, dump, I uh, don't know if it covers dumping, no, not dumping, but um, there's, there are some interesting bylaws out there that take enforcement in a kind of in a different way um, where you can actually have fees applied for visits that are made because of uh, uh, noise issues. So as opposed to fines, which can sometimes be hard to implement and they can end up on your taxes if you're a repeat offender. So that'll be something we can discuss as we move along here. Update key bylaws. Uh, so everything we've talked about, the tree bylaw, um, the animal control bylaw, dumping, the business, the business, uh, business permit bylaw, building bylaw. So those are things that will ideally tackle in 2023, I have a feeling they'll go to the next year as well. Develop a communication, information and technology and social media policy. Uh, an annual strategic planning review, so we're, gonna, we're actually going to do this again in November. And finally, um, assess and update district policies as needed. So that's the strategic plan in a nutshell. And, um, it, is, next is year... Oh, is it one Yep. Okay, finally, increase public engagement activities. That's what we do today. So <laughs> I'm going to leave things off now. And uh, next year, we'll make sure that uh, the, the screen is bright for all the uh, and big for all the elements. So thank you very much for your time. And I just, I guess we now open it up for comment. Uh, did you want to, uh, let's, let's um, did anybody on council wish to say anything else? We've had quite a bit of time to discuss this together. So. Okay, so let's move it to the public. Does anybody want to uh, address any of the points with this strategic plan? I just wanna say I'm really proud of this council because strategic planning has never been a part of the municipality. And so um, we've, we've started the process. Uh, this is a draft, it will be amended. It's a live document and it's our plan to go forward. And um, there are uh, timelines uh, written into, the, into this, as well as indicators of success. Um, and um, I think uh, we've done a very good job as, as a draft. We'll get better as we go along. Go ahead. Can I just ask about the public input process? It, it, I mean, it's on the agenda tonight, of course. Mm -hmm. And are we doing anything beyond that in terms of um, how we push things forward? Is it just this evening is the one opportunity for the public? Yeah. Because we haven't announced it before the meeting, and so I'm just wondering if people would be prepared to uh, to provide us the input that we might like. Um, I, I think as we move along, we will refine the public input process. But in terms of trying to, just because the the process itself has been going on for so long, and um, I, I think there is benefit in finalizing the plan, and with that, living with it for a little while and seeing where we go. So, yeah, next year. A little bit better for sure. Yeah, don't forget we're going to do this again in November. This is May, and so we're going to be reviewing this. and um, And the public absolutely is welcome to send in comments afterwards. Um, it was posted with the agenda, the the whole strategic plan as well. Um, does anybody want to speak to it? I have a question towards it. With this uh, active transportation plan, with how is this being engaged with the public? Would this be like through an advisory committee similar to uh, surrounding municipalities, or would this be just going through a consultant? Thank you. Uh, what, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, what we found is is the only way that we are able to apply for grants, which some municipalities have gotten in the millions of dollars worth of grants for putting in things like uh, bike lanes and, <clears throat> and roadside trails and, and other 
other uh, you know safety features along the roads, but um, but the applications pretty much all require uh, a consultant-led active transportation plan. So when Councillor Shukin and I um, dis discussed it uh, with some consultants, uh, the first step is to, in the fall was when the intakes come in, would be to get funding for, um, a, for a consultant. And then, and that's, uh, and then once you get the consultant, then you can apply for the next level, which is to actually get the grant uh, for the study. And then once you have a study, then you can start applying for these these grants. And this is what I found out like years ago too, because the uh, the former CAO said that you know they had tried to apply for grants in the past for bike lanes, and uh, had been turned down every time. That the only basically it's just the only as far as I know. Do you have anything? Yeah. No, well, well, a little bit. Um, just in terms of Colin's question about public input, I'm sure there'll be public input yes. as we go, and even just a council meeting in and of itself has opportunities for public input. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I imagine when we, you know, when we do go through that process of of getting the consultant, so that we'll do something with the public then. Mm -hmm. And now I was going to add add to as far as your your, la your other comment is that I'm really hoping that in this, uh, the Growing Communities Fund, that a little bit of that money will, will be available for some of our road safety things, as you were speaking about. Okay. Jimmy Carlin, World Fund on Cliff Drive. Um, First off, I think your tie to shoe is pretty good for this, but not, not bad at all. And, uh, and I'm very aware that the last thing any council wants is some guy who retired too long ago, who's done this for too long, coming and saying how he would have done it differently. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, but two, two comments. One, um, I noticed yeah, the environmental and social uh, columns deal with environment and, and social issues in the community. When you go to the economic column, <coughs> by and large, it's going to copper, your corporate fiscal plan. Uh, that's unusual. I'm not going to say uh, I differently because most of the community economic uh, planning I've seen has large, largely been verbiage with not a heck of a lot that, that uh, municipalities can actually do in practice, but, but it's not typical to be totally corporate focused. The one exception, it's the one I did want to draw attention to, is the last bullet, limit development in accordance with OCP and the regional growth strategy. And it's not immediately clear, that's potentially ambiguous, but also possible problems. One interpretation of this is you won't approve uh, a development that is contrary to the OCP. And that's the law. You can't do it. You don't need to write it down. You can't do it. Um, the other interpretation is that if someone came in to amend the OCP, which would enable them then to get a, a, a development approved, you wouldn't consider it. And that way, if that's what you mean, don't go down that road. There's all kinds of legal problems with that road. You can finish up potentially with your right to approve amendments to the OCP being delegated over this to the province and you have nothing to do with it. So you don't really want to. So I would have another look at that and say it's, it's either redundant or it's dangerous. So don't, you don't need it. You might want to, if you wanted to lurch into community stuff, you might want to look at something that said you would encourage um, economic development opportunities that are consistent with the OCP because you do have a revenue, sustainable revenue probably means some non-residential tax opportunities somewhere along the line that you want it consistent with the chosen values and, and the chosen OCP. So that's all. The only other one, and and 
when I first read it, just fine, is that reassess the district's approach to roads and transportation management, and thank you for explaining that some further. I'm comfortable with that. The only reason why I got a little squirmish about that was some of the comments on the budget that came from the community started to talk as if maintaining the roads was somehow old fossil fuel thinking and that by cutting the budget you were doing a really good job in getting away from that kind of thinking. Mm. Um, and I'm an old expressway fighter and this isn't expressways we're talking about. You're talking about maintaining the key system for distributing goods and seniors getting to, you know, school kids getting to school and all the rest of it. So it's really crucial you maintain the road system. If you want to reassess your approach to it, terrific, I have no objection. I just worried when I saw that was, oh, how those random comments actually have more influence than they should. Otherwise, keep time to shoot us. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else wish to uh, speak? <coughs> Uh, I wasn't, uh, I'm not really sure, but if there's, if it's in this strategic plan to, if there's anything in there to deal with the rapidly increasing traffic um, and parking problems and uh, waste baskets at the beaches, for instance, uh, any enhancements that we can do for all this, all these people that are coming out here for recreation. Um, I know it's a big problem. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. And there's lots of time to, for you to provide input as well. We're, we're always happy to receive uh, letters from the public. Okay. With that, uh, we'll move on. Do you want a motion to accept uh, the strategic plan, Councillor uh, Shukin? Well, I. I think what we can do tonight, and again, not with some of the great input that we've had, is we can actually approve the strategic plan okay. tonight. So, so I, I, I would move that we, um, we approve the Council Strategic Plan 2023-2026. Okay. So this is moved by Councillor Shukin, seconded by Council Donaldson. Discussion on the motion? Councillor Gray? Well, I'm, um, I'll vote in favour of the, the uh, motion. But I have to say, I wasn't uh, aware we were going to do this tonight, So, I'm, but I, I, I see the point. Um, and if we're continuing to take community input, and then we'll do a revision, a, you know, open for a review in, in um, November, that makes sense to me. Okay. Um, so, uh, would you prefer this come back to another council meeting so you can have more time to review it? No, I had a good, uh, good run at it. I was just... Um, with the following the process, one of the points that we have is um, to uh, increase public engagement activities, and so I'm just eager that we provide lots of opportunity for the public to have input. But I think if we take this on now and we're going to review it, as you say, within a six month period, that makes sense. I'm, okay. I'm speaking in favor of the motion. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, I have noticed that too, but I think so far we have been doing quite a bit of public um, engagement. We certainly did through the budgeting process. Um, at every meeting, we had uh, several opportunities. Actually, it was every page. Um, we have the public participation. Obviously, we've been doing that historically for years, question period, that sort of stuff. People are certainly uh, giving us lots of input via emails, phone calls, and uh, even tonight, um, lots of different comments coming forward. So those sorts of things are all good opportunities for us to continue with that and something more formal, as maybe uh, Councilor Gray is suggesting. Um, certainly we can consider that going forward when we revise this another time. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the things we may want to consider um, a few months ago, uh, Colwood had an ideas fair. Mm -hmm. I took lots of pictures, I just haven't had time to post it on Facebook and show everybody, but it, it, it really was a really interesting opportunity for the public to gather, to um, throw around their different ideas of what their, their vision for Colwood going forward was. Of course, it's very different than Machosum, but the framework 
uh, for their different uh, stations regarding their parks and their sewers and their um, events for seniors and uh, engaging the youth we could all use and, and, and Colwood staff would be really um, interested in helping us move forward on a, an ideas fair here. So that's something we can consider and I think that would be great not only in generating ideas but also bringing the communities together. So, mm -hmm. go ahead. Maybe I'll just mention the two areas that I'm not as clear about, and that's the one said, which were described as creation of economic sustainable working group or advisory committee, and I just heard your words tonight, so I have a little bit more information about it, but I'm not really clear what that would do, so I'm looking forward to learning more about that one. And then the other one that I'm not so clear about is develop a village core strategy, what, what those words actually mean, but uh, thankfully I heard Councillor Shuka tonight describe that a little bit more. Um, but just to mention that. The other thing would be, I think we've heard lots about housing tonight, and we know about the short-term vacation rental issue, so there's something to be done there. It needn't be in the plan tonight, but I think we're moving towards that anyway in terms of the short-term vacation rental you've spoken about before, Councilor Shukin. So we'll see those things coming up, and, and I want to sort of say this evening about housing and those questions, but um, I'm all good. All good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Councilor Eck? Uh, yeah, I think it's a good starting point, and uh, and we'll be looking at it again in, in November. I think that, that works. Okay, great. So the whole purpose of this was just so we're not a reactionary council. So we're, we're looking forward, putting plans. This is what we want to achieve in the four years. So mm -hmm. and congratulations. This, oh. is, this is good. So first, we've got a motion on the table. Does anybody wish to speak to it more? If not, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to uh, number nine. This is the staff report. Um, Ms. Tarnowski regarding the MIABC Risk Management Conference on page 25 of your agenda package. So I have to say this is the most engaging conference I've ever attended. And it's an era of risk management, if you can imagine that now. So what MIABC has done is, um, through very different, various formats of, of educating, it's not just uh, having a speaker up in front and just basically performing an a, a information dump on the attendees. Um, what I found the most interesting session was, was a three-part session where uh, the panel, which consisted of legal counsel as well as um, uh, staff from municipalities, actually walked through a case of uh, claims. So we walked through discovery, discovery of, of documentation, and the actual trial, if you will, in which the um, audience were transformed to juries. So you actually got to listen to the presentations, the cross examinations, and then vote on what your um, uh, verdict would be if as if you were, you were a jury. So at the end of that conclusion of that session, the legal counsel actually walked through the actual um, case, because it was a, a real case, and, and explained what was actually decided by the judge. So um, like I said, that was, a, that was really great and engaging format. Um, definitely added to the stickiness for sure. Um, and another part that was very exciting, uh, unfortunately I was in one of the contestant was they had a, what was called a five thousand dollar question so um, all participants threw the names in a, in a hat if you were selected you went up to the stage you were the participant and uh, um, the the host would ask you questions about risk management different areas of risk management if you answered correctly you would win a thousand dollars so you could win up to five thousand dollars not actual cash but grants towards the MIC coverage, mm -hmm. so it was very exciting. Um, all in all, it was very, very, um, very, very insightful and definitely a very beneficial conference. So. Okay, great, thank you very much. Anybody have any questions or yes. comments? Thank you for reporting on that, that's great. Thank you, Ms. Tarnowski. Uh, Councillor Shukin, followed by Councillor Gray. Sure, so through you, Mayor Little, mm -hmm. um, Ms. Tarnowski, anything like super relevant or resonant in terms of the situation in the Chosen? Uh, definitely. So the sessions that were relevant is um, about public works. 
Mm-hmm. And so um, I got an opportunity to really make some great connections on, on, on people that are actually managers of public works that I can tap on now to ask questions. And the other area that I, I was relevant to be chosen is the areas of bio enforcement. So it's really, again, back to um, the discussion with that quite often is where is the line of, of bio enforcement issue itself? Um, is it administration or is it, um, when does it actually move into the arena of, of um, having council involvement? So. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Just a moment. Uh, Councillor Gray. <coughs> Might as well. No, I was just going to say, uh, great going to such, um, I mean, these are important meetings, especially um, around um, the insurance association that insures us and, um, and the risk management part of it, so well done. And I guess my question really was, do we want all staff to be reporting on their continuing education? Is that the plan or what are we up to? Yeah, no, the, the request was actually by me. We had some uh, comments at the budgeting workshop that we were spending too much on on um, conferences and we were traveling too much and the council has traveled to Nanaimo, uh, not to New Zealand, but to Nanaimo. And uh, the uh, interim CAO has traveled to Vancouver and it's for a purpose. And so um, when either council or uh, staff attend um, workshops or um, taxpayer funded conferences, I think it's great if they give an idea, especially to council, but to the public on, on what they're doing. And, uh, I thank you for that. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. That sounded really interesting. It, that would have been something great. We could have done role playing at some of the ones we've gone to, but maybe in the future. We'll see. Okay. That sounds great. Thanks so much. Okay, so thank you for that uh, report. Moving on to page 27 of the agenda, and this is the uh, CRD bylaw and animal care services report from March of 2023, page 27 through 30 or 29. Uh, any comments on this? No? If not, I'll uh, take a motion to receive this report. So moved. Moved by Councillor Shukin, seconded by Council Donaldson. Comments, questions? We received them monthly. Okay, call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carry. Thank you. Uh, correspondence. Uh, this was a, a request to council um, uh, from uh, regarding the letter back from uh, to our letter to Minister Farnsworth. The, the response letter back. Um, this is regarding the request for the uh, MIST or the Mobile Youth services team and the cred team we were advocating along with other municipalities for funding um, this was a letter indicating that uh, they were going to give one uh, one-time uh, funding of hundred and thirty thousand dollars to these programs um, they provide critical um, care critical advo- or yeah advocacy and uh, support for youth, especially youth who are, ex- who are experiencing housing instability or issues at home, issues in the school. Um, and um, it was great to see uh, the letter back from Minister Farnsworth. I would like to actually send another letter, um, if that's okay. I would like to send a letter uh, thanking him for his letter and asking him for continued uh, funding for MIST and for CRED so that every year they're not in this position of a police officer and a support worker working and doing really critical work on the streets uh, with uh, many youths in all of the 13 municipalities. I'd like to see stable funding for these. So that's my idea, what do you think? (laughs) <laughs> Respectful letter. I, I have to congratulate you. It was, it was great to see $130,000 uh, coming to Pacific Center, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if people realize Pacific Center for um, Family Services used to be in Mishosen mm-hmm. on Pierce Road uh, mm-hmm. back in the 70s. And then it went to Heatherbell Road and uh, then Whale Road, and now it's just the backside of Whale Road. It's the same property, I believe. Mm. Um, they do phenomenal work for, for families. I know many people have gone there. Um, uh, you know, they, not just, not just for youth, obviously they do things, they do the, uh, 
with the one about uh, staying at home when we do it here. For the seniors. Oh, um, aging in place. Aging in place, <laughs> yes. Um, but they do a lot of work for isolated seniors, individuals addressing family violence, youth outreach, email count and email counseling as well, not just in person, youth gang and exploitation prevention and intervention, family and couples counseling, counseling to address substance abuse, mental health counseling, trauma um, therapy, all sorts of different things. So $130,000 certainly will help, but something ongoing would be great. The, um, the walk we did out in soup, the uh, coldest night of the year, uh, some of those funds go to places like Pacific Family Services. And um, Pacific Family has actually come to us for grant and aid in the past as well. And you can see them this year, I was kind of surprised. But uh, thank you for, uh, for advocating for them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we, we did that as a council. And there's other municipalities that wrote in. You can tell from their letter, this was probably the letter that they sent to Souk, because they mentioned Souk in here. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Uh, it, we're all in it together. So um, with that, I would like, uh, if it's OK, I'd like a motion to write an additional I'll letter. Go ahead. I'll make Sorry. a motion, yep. yeah. To send a, a letter um, in response to um, Minister Farnworth um, seeking ongoing funding for the missed cred. Uh, program at PCFSA. Okay, great. Uh, moved by Councillor Gray, seconded by Councillor Epp. More mm -hmm. discussion? Yeah, I would just say that I think the package we received before was quite um, um, impressive in terms of what's going on and what these groups are doing in terms of crime reduction and helping uh, youth in need and particularly diverting uh, young people from exploitation. So I think it's worth pushing forward. I imagine the, and you have the personal experience working with the group, um, um, but I think uh, if we put our names to it, it's worthwhile. Okay, and they've also produced a, a 27 minute documentary and I think uh, it'd be great to show it at one of our council meetings uh, because it is shocking what is going on. We, we think of you know large centers like Vancouver or LA, New York having problems with youth and exploitation and sexual violence and um, we have a lot of it in Victoria, sadly. And so they, these, these are the people that are the boots on the ground trying to advocate for those youth. Go ahead, Councillor Shukin. Thanks, and I, I very much support the idea of writing a letter. The, the one thing I would just maybe mention to do is to connect with um, the other allies in mm -hmm. the district, whether it's the other mayors or councillors, and, and just make note that this is underway. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other comment, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Great. Thank you very much. Regarding bylaws, uh, we on page 33, we have the five-year financial plan and tax rate bylaw. Uh, did you want to say anything about this, Ms. Tarnowski? If not, I'll turn it over to the finance chair. Yep. Okay. So, Councillor Donaldson, uh, what are your recommendations? I would like to recommend that Council adopt Financial Plan 2023-2027 Bylaw Number 683. Uh, yeah. Do them together. Uh, no, let's do them separately at the third reading. I'd second. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moved by Councillor Donaldson, seconded by Councillor Shukin. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Go ahead. Okay, and I'd like to motion that the Council adopt tax rate 2023 bylaw number 684. The third reading? Yes. Yep. Moved by Councillor Donaldson. Okay. Yep, just, just a sec. Just go ahead, Ms. Hansen. Sorry, just clarifying it's for adoption. Say, say that again uh, for adoption of uh, bylaw 684. And I believe that is the case. We've done three readings. We did three readings yep. at the last day. Yeah, so great. Did Shelley say, or did Councillor Dawson say 683 instead of 684? Um, no, she, she had mentioned uh, adoption, but then, uh, then you had, uh, had said third reading, so I just wanted to make sure that it was adoption. Okay. Okay, so we're yeah. moving adoption of bylaws 683 and 684. So this is your motion is for adoption of 684. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Moved by Councillor Donaldson, seconded by Councillor Epp. Uh, more discussion? No. All in favor? Opposed? 
carried. Thank you. And that's it for those, right? Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, now we have the um, on page 41 of the agenda. Um, a thanks uh, to Ms. Tarnowski for this um, note to Council. Um, so on March 3rd, we were notified that uh, we were the recipient of this large award of over $2.4 million for the Growing Communities Grant. Um, under the terms of the agreement, the district must set up a separate and dedicated reserve fund uh, for this grant um, um, as allowed to under Section 188 of the Community Charter, and this is what this is all about. Um, did you have anything further you wanted to add? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any, <coughs> excuse me, I don't have any additional information to add to it, but it's just that this is just formality. As the mayor has mentioned, it's a requirement as part of the grant that has to be statutory bylaw. That's why it's in front of council um, for establishment of bylaw specific for this reserve, oh, sorry, this funding. Okay. And in this council package, you have uh, some of the uh, verbiage from the provincial government right regarding the guidelines. There is a time limit, so we are to spend this money within five years. It's got to be in a separate reserve fund. can't be transferred to other reserve funds, but other reserve funds could be added to this. Um, that's, that's within the parameters. We also must report out annually, so there's a number of different uh, recommend, not recommendations, but stipulations uh, with that terms of agreement. Okay, so... Um, do we need to move move the reading separately? The first. Um, no, you just have to move the motion to set up the uh, um, okay. reserve. Okay. I don't think we'll have any trouble spending it in five years. <laughs> first, second page reading. Okay, I will move second page. Page forty-two. I was. Oh. Sorry, I was looking at the other side. That's okay. All right, and move that council give first, second, and third readings to bylaw number 685. Yep, we're just going to do that first, 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 and then we'll do second and third. Yeah. So we're going to uh, move that council do first reading. Of okay, oh, well, that's what I asked, but yeah. <laughs> anyway. All right, and move that council give first reading to bylaw number 685. So okay. moved by Councillor Epps, seconded by Councillor Donaldson. Call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. It's a formality, but we're, we must do this according to our Deputy Corporate Officer. Go ahead. Right, I move that Council give second reading to file number 685. Moved by Councillor Epps, seconded by Council Donaldson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Go ahead. I move that Council give third reading to file number 685. Moved by Councillor Epps, seconded by Councillor Donaldson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. And I'll move that Council approve the District of Chosen Reserves and Surplus Policy F-100.52 as amended. Moved by Councillor Epp, seconded by Council Shukin. Comments? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say I, um, I think this is a wonderful um, um, grant to have received for the District of Michosin. Um, but I also want to reflect on the value of these reserve funds. You know, we've got really healthy reserves, it seems to me. And um, this is a situation with this particular grant. I'm hoping we'll be really careful with what we do with it. You know, we have that um, feasibility work going on at the fire hall, and if we decide to do that, it seems to me this fund will get, uh, you know, probably needs to be pulled into a reserve for the fire hall and not a whole lot of smaller projects. Um, you know, we think back about our budget we've just passed, you know, we got a 3% tax increase for the policing costs which was a real concern for us. You know, would we, how would we manage that? Well, it turns out it was um, kind of straightforward given the previous councils and Mayor Little and, and uh, Councillor Eperon, the previous council, um, the foresight of, of previous councils establishing budgetary reserve accounts um, really helped us and we'll be drawing on for, for a number of years now, the policing one anyway, keeping at that uh, policing costs uh, low until entirely absorbed within our budget. So we're thanks to those who came before us, and I'm just eager that we be uh, look on this one real careful too in terms of what we leave for the people coming after us. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? 
so we are going to be discussing our priorities for the growing communities fund at another meeting and so we'll have all input from the community but also input from all the councillors so we can consider that and I assure you we'll, we'll spend it wisely okay okay with that thank you that that uh, finishes that off um, other business we don't have any uh, we've got some time we've got six and a half minutes for the question period yeah we, we didn't vote oh we didn't vote I'm sorry we didn't vote okay so I'm going to call the question uh, do we know what we're voting on here this is the growing this is the uh, surplus F 100.52 with the proposed amendment right okay I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you for that. Okay, now we have five and a half minutes uh, for a question period. Does anybody have any questions for council? Hello, Eric White, 1490 Chosen Road. Um, seeing as the tax increase is 13.9%, Obviously, there wasn't a lot of digging in the couch cushions by you guys to tighten that up. Um, I'm wondering, what is Machosen doing to address poverty in our community? Hmm. Well, actually, I beg to differ that we didn't dig in. If you had attended the budget workshops, we, we actually had talked a lot about the budget. Um, and um, we, we actually did give quite a bit of consideration uh, to the budgets, what we have um, before us in terms of uh, policing costs, mm -hmm. there was careful consideration. What are we doing towards poverty? Um, yeah, what uh, we have people in our community who are um, not so well off and 13.9% is going to uh, hurt them drastically if not make them leave our community. Um, I'm wondering what we're doing to address that. Um, hmm. Alright, sit with that one. Sorry, say that again? Sit with that one. It, it, mull it over. Figure out what we can come back to the next meeting. Okay. How are we addressing poverty? Okay. Thank you for that. Anybody else want, wish to comment? Oh, yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Leonore Davison, Speyside Lane. Uh, I'd like to know, if possible, uh, the percentage of wells versus the percentage of city water people. Okay. I think that's a very pertinent thing in uh, granting mm -hmm. high density or density at all. Yeah, actually I don't know that. I know that the vast majority of people in Matrosen tap into wells as opposed to service by CRD water. I don't think it is as much as it used to be. Okay. So I, I would like to see a percentage and, you know, sort of where the, uh, like I know, <laughs> I know where a lot of it is because I'm, actually okay then. so I know where they come down Rocky Point Road and into uh, East Soup Road and everything but I just wondered what the percentage is now because that is a very pertinent <coughs> factor as well so. and I think they did a very good job on uh, looking at the budget and everything and a lot of countries have a poverty thing put in overseas if you're found out in the street they take you home to your family to look after you I think that's a great idea. I should have put that in in Canada maybe a century ago. <laughs> yeah. You are responsible for your own family. Okay, thank you. Madam, yeah, um, Leonora's uh, question is a great one, mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering about the answer that, that question myself just a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I wonder if we could ask staff to provide that information. Yeah. Actually, the, the, uh, our planner, Catherine, um, would probably have that information. Um, Ms. Stronofsky, could we ask the planner to provide us with some of that, those statistics? I can ask the planner and the engineer. And what? And the engineers. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Kelsey. Yeah, Johnson. I just want to, um, if I can, uh, may not really answer um, Mr. White's query, but I do want to share something with you that as I was sitting in the gallery here not that long ago, did bring this up at, um, in the last term to council about how we do actually have homeless people coming through Machosen 
right at my back door. And recently, as it was last Monday afternoon, um, the RCMP were at the end of Flesh Road because people were sleeping underneath the bridge. So it is in our it is in our community, and it's some people don't think it's here. And I'm not saying that people are living here that are homeless, but it's everybody's responsibility. And so what we've done is we've called people to come and help so that they're not without help or well, without I'm services. And so if you do know of somebody that's needing help, please let us know or the staff or somebody else that can help so that we as a community can do better. Can I address this? And also, um, with the fire department, um, we do provide a lot of services outside the scope of the volunteer fire, de fire department in terms of support for uh, seniors in the community. We've got a seniors resource center which provides help for seniors regardless of their monetary status. So we do uh, provide um, some services. Members of council have already um, in the last five months uh, attended our place uh, on uh, was it three occasions now to help serve um, meals at our place in Vic in Victoria it's not that's not we weren't doing it in Michosin but we were helping other municipalities who have uh, services for people that are sleeping rough um, so we have we ha have had um, some input into that as well go ahead uh, so I just mentioned too that seniors in the community have the ability to defer their taxes which don't get paid until their property is sold. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. And, and just on one last note, um, forethought from previous councils and public and administration, uh, one of the reasons we went through allowing things like attached, detached suites, um, the public came to us and said, or came to the administration and said, what happens when I age out and I don't need this big house? So what we've started to see is people are moving into the smaller dwelling of the unit where the family, the growing family lives in the larger portion of the house. So it's almost an essence of multi-generational, but in some cases they weren't even related. And so they turn that around. So, so that is, it's just one mechanism, it's not a solution to everything and it doesn't help everybody, but it is one of those other factors um, to offset some costs and people still being close by and, and whatnot. Okay, so with that, it's 9.30, I'll take a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Moved by Councillor Shukin, seconded by Council Donaldson. Call the question, all in favor? Opposed, carried, thank you. Motion. Accepted and we're adjourned. Permission to first. Mm -hmm.